Let me uh, welcome you all to the um, spring 2017 CNI member meeting. And let me welcome you also to Albuquerque. Uh, I am delighted that so many of you have been able to join us. And we have a very, very rich program over the next day and a half, um, uh, which I think you'll enjoy. Um, just a couple of things uh, before we get started. First off, um, I would like to welcome our international visitors. Um, international travel is getting ever more interesting, and uh, I appreciate those of you who um, went through that to join us. Um, in that vein also, I want to recognize three new members who have joined since our last meeting. And interestingly enough, they are all international members. Um, I'd like to welcome the Guitar National Library, the University of Limerick, and the University of Saskatchewan in Canada. Thank you all, and um, I welcome you to CNI. So we have a treat for you today. Um, we have a keynote speaker that I think will be familiar to some of you and should be familiar to a lot more of you. Um, I have been, I guess I'd describe it as an admirer of Allison Head's work from a bit of a distance over the years. Um, Joan Lippincott has a, had a chance to work a bit more closely with her, including doing a marvelous interview that appeared on um, Allison's uh, blog um, a couple of months ago. Um, and I'm going to invite her to more fully introduce Allison. And then she and I are going to sit down so we can see the slides. So, Joan. Thanks, Cliff. <clears throat> I'm delighted to introduce our opening plenary speaker, Allison Head, Executive Director and Principal Investigator of Project Information Literacy. Currently, Allison is also a research scientist at the Meta Lab at Harvard and a visiting scholar at University of Nebraska Lincoln's University Libraries. This year, she was awarded the inaugural S.T. Lee Lectureship in Library Leadership and Innovation at Harvard Libraries. For many years, she was affiliated with the University of Washington iSchool, and Allison earned her PhD in Information Science from UC Berkeley. It's critically important that library and information professionals have data about their students in order to make informed decisions about such concerns as developing services and partnering with faculty on pedagogy and curriculum. As information professionals, we also need to understand the gaps in what we expect students to do with information, what they actually do with information, and students' own perceptions of their information expertise. Since 2008, Project Information Literacy has been asking probing and perceptive questions about how today's college students are accessing and using information in their studies, their everyday lives, and their first work experience after graduation. The project employs a team uh, and has worked with over 60 higher ed institutions of all types, and they've published nine open access reports on their findings. The quantitative data that Allison provides in report, reports help us understand the broad trends and identifies areas in which libraries should focus more attention or develop new strategies. What has often intrigued me the most is the qualitative data that Project Information Literacy presents. Hearing the students' voices in quotes from interviews has sometimes fed my own imagination and encouraged me to think in new ways of what libraries can do to educate students beyond traditional information literacy sessions. They prompt me to examine underlying assumptions of my own and of the library profession. Project Information Literacy has also provided insights into students' use of library space and library space planning efforts in a recent report. 
I encourage you to visit the Project Information Literacy website. Not only will you find the reports, but interviews, and thank you, Allison, for the recent interview of me, and also a section called Practical Project Information Literacy, which highlights some examples of how various libraries have acted on findings of the report. Please join me in welcoming Allison Head. Okay, we had some technical problems. What would, a, what would a plenary speech be like if you didn't have technical problems? I was so proud I had my new MacBook. Um, and nothing really worked on it, so the, I have to thank Angelo for his brilliance, and I've learned an important lesson, come early, like 11.30 when you're speaking at 1.15. So welcome. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you can see my slides, um, and I'm glad to be using my new MacBook $1,500 later. <laughs> so um, welcome, everybody. Joan, thank you for, for your introduction. Um, I think you've researched me better probably than my parents ever did. I mean, I had a difficult time, as my father used to say. I know what you do is important, but i just not sure what that is. <laughs> so hopefully over the next hour, I'll be able to convince you of that and what I do. Um, I'm going to stand here because a mobile uh, uh, microphone isn't possible with my tensile shirt. Um, it's been a day like that. So can everybody, <laughs> right, and here I am. Um, can everybody hear me, please? Yes, okay, hey, turning it around. Okay, here we are in this room. A lot of you I don't know. A lot of times I speak at conferences, I give a keynote, um, and I run into a lot of people. Um, so earlier today, I was introducing myself to a lot of people over coffee. And I've had some great conversations this morning. And I'm glad I prepared this slide as a way to pull us together and also kick off CNI for this year. And that is the connections we have in the room. How many of you are deans? of academic university libraries. Just raise your hand, you don't need to, usually you're not a shy lot, okay? That's it's got quite a few. Um, how about those that work in infotech, whether you're a CIO, I know there are CIOs, I recognize some of the names from the list, great. And there's Patrick, who I know, who gave me a tour of Northeastern, even recognized some faces after I said I didn't. Um, and then also, uh, who am I leaving out? I know, uh, of course, foundations, funding, of course, yes, funding. Um, who comes from foundations or organizations that work to support libraries and work in this area? Oh, don't be shy, I won't ask you for money. Okay, until later, okay. Okay, so the foundation, folks. Anybody, sometimes we get public librarians. None, okay, and we've got some international attendees as well. And then there are also librarians that work in a number of different capacities that I'm not leaving out, I'm saving you for last. How many do we have in that category? Okay, any professors? And, and I don't mean tenure track, somebody from a different department? Okay, anybody, oh, there you go. What department? Computers, okay, makes sense, computer science. Anybody else that I've left out that during Q&A will tell me they were offended because I left them out? I'm hedging my bets. Okay, there we are. I think what this slide shows is some of the overlap and in interests that we have. I mean, all of us, I think, are committed to higher education, and especially within that space, libraries. And by libraries, often the use of these different bubbles I have above it, resources. And resources have changed dramatically as well as the way that we deliver them, as well as even our conception of what libraries are. When I worked on the learning space study that we just finished that came out earlier, late last year actually, it really came to me that libraries themselves and the mission as we know um, has really 
changed, as we all know, from collections to becoming really active learning hubs and what that means for a particular campus, how it can reflect the needs, the teaching and learning needs, as well as the IT needs. One of the major findings in that study was that from the qualitative interviews where we profiled 22 different recent library space projects was that in building those new structures from the ground up or renovating them, what we found was, surprisingly, plugs was one of the areas that was a best practice, that librarians beat their head against the wall trying to convince architects of the importance of plugs. It's really symbolic of not only the learning, but how learning takes place, and how recharge stations, and how mobile and ubiquitous technology has woven into the work we do. Where I fall in this discussion is, let me go back here, where I fall in this discussion is in the arena of teaching and learning. I'm interested in students. I was a professor for 25 years, and I'll tell you a short anecdote. I have time. Um, I'll tell you a short anecdote. I taught new media. I taught at St. Mary's College. It's a small liberal arts college in the San Francisco Bay Area. And one day, my star student came up to me senior year. And this is a conversation that probably happens a lot. And she came up and said, can I talk to you alone? I thought, oh. You know, you know, a small Catholic school, I thought, oh, I hope you're not pregnant or you know, something, or you know, you got married last weekend. And she waited till everybody cleared out. And then she said, I know you know how to use the library. I said, yeah. And she said, I'm working on my thesis. I've never used the library here. And she, coincidentally, we had just gotten a job at Google. And I said, let me walk you over. And introduced her to a librarian that was actually a former student of mine. And at that point, I became really interested in how I had taught for so many years. And here, I really imagined the research process for course research being something very different than was actually occurring. And I did a small study at St. Mary's and ended up writing something for First Monday in college and research libraries. And somebody from the Midwest, a librarian, wrote me and said, that's a really interesting article, but none of that would ever happen at my big public school. And I thought, that's really interesting in itself. And that's an invitation. Luckily, Joe Brannon was the editor at the time of College and Research Libraries. He told me they had gotten a lot of reaction to the piece. I told him about the Midwest concern. And he said, I'll be in your sample. Now you have two schools. And from then, from that point forward, PIL came into being. And it grew. And what we've done, what we've tried to do, I ended up going to University of Washington and um, really had the great honor of working with Mike Eisenberg, um, who I think is giving a keynote in South Carolina right at this moment now with Dave Lankus. But Mike Eisenberg, it became Head and Eisenberg. And um, we both were interested in information literacy. And um, as he told me, I'm there to mentor you. And sure, it can be Head and Eisenberg. I'll retire in a few years. And I said, well, I can't move. I live in California. And uh, my husband's an attorney, and he's not going to take the Washington bar. And he said, oh, we don't have office space. And I said, oh, OK. Well, are you sure it's Head and Eisenberg, and I, can, and I can lead? And he said, oh, God, that's not a problem. I won't be here in four years. You can always call me, but I won't be here. I thought, God, who is this guy? He's just, runs the, I, he had run the iSchool and founded it. And I said, well, do we have a deal? And he said, yeah, deal. And I said, OK, great. We'll get started. And he said, oh, Allison, you didn't ask about money. <laughs> and if you know Mike, it was a great response. And Mike taught me a lot about money and funders. And we were lucky enough during that tenure to be funded by IMLS a couple of different times, uh, MacArthur, 
for over two years. And then just recently, last week, um, we were funded, this is new news, by Sloan. And Sloan Foundation is going to fund us with something we're going to build, actually, as part of a larger project for the Open Syllabus Project, um, OSP. So we're really excited about that. That's a project that my young friend, brilliant friend, Dennis Tennant, and I envisioned him 90%, me 10, while we were at the Berkman. So what PIL is and what it's growing into is, I call it PIL as the acronym. This is a study that really has grown its sample in a grassroots way, in giving presentations, talking about our findings. Often people think we're much larger than we are. We do large studies with small teams. And often the teams are made up li of li academic librarians who have taken a leave to work with me on PIL on a specific study that they have an interest in. And that's something that grew in an organic way and that has worked really well for us. So we'll work with four or five people. Often people will call PIL on the number and if I answer the phone, they say, oh God, Allison Head, I didn't think you'd answer the phone. I always say, if I didn't, no one did. You know, no one would be able to answer the phone. So we're a small organization that tries to do really large studies. Something that I'm, I'm, I'm really proud of and I'm glad that we've done, both as a researcher and as somebody in education, is to include community colleges in our sample. It's not just for your public and privates. We have over 260 campuses, uh, someone told me recently, boy, that's access to one in eight college students in the U.S. I'm not sure if that's entirely accurate. Um, but we're U.S. focused. The library learning space study, actually, we included a couple of library projects that occurred in Canada. And we use social science methods. To, we use surveys, we use interviews, we've used content analysis, and we're ongoing and national. And that's kind of been our marching orders. We, we don't, I don't have a school. I mean, I, I work at University of Nebraska as a visiting scholar, and also I've been a fellow or affiliated with Harvard now for seven years. But since I am no longer at UW, I really don't have a school per se. And this has been a good thing for the project in a lot of ways, because we've been able to do our studies, I've been able to go into different settings, this works well with students, and talk to them about how they conduct research, how their habits are changing, even in those short four years, and then be able to pause and say, I'm not from here, you can tell me whatever is going on for you. And then pause, because they're in disbelief, and then I'll say, because you'll never see me again. And at that point, we found the floodwaters open, that students really did have stories to tell, my background was in journalism, and that was really my interest, was to tell students stories, like the first student that came and talked to me after class. I know a couple of years ago you had Esther Hargate speak, who I know from the Berkmans, a colleague and a friend. And MacArthur often asked us, or often asked me, how are you different than Esther? And I'm different than Esther, we've laughed about this, in that I focus on behaviors and really collect qualitative as well as we use mixed methods. If you care, care about different methodologies, it's an analytical study where we look for trends, uh, relationships, uh, rigorous relationships between the different variables that are in our sample, and then we choose really different schools. Sometimes people ask me, why is Harvard always in your studies? Well, it's not, but it has been in a number of our studies, and usually because it's such an outlier in terms of the resources it has, and also in terms of the students that it attracts. And at the other end, we'll include a community college somewhere that um, students, that has a lot of certificate pro programs and such, maybe students go on to four-year schools, and we'll look at what is across that continuum? How are students the same, and how do they differ? I have to admit, Harvard has more Wikipedia users. Um, that didn't make them happy. Um, 
But anyway, that's kind of the lay of the land of what we do and how we're structured. Um, briefly, I'll go through a timeline to talk about where this journey has taken us, this research. The first study that we did was actually funded by ProQuest. And they went on a listserv that librarians frequented uh, through a ALA listservs and said, you know, we've got some money and we want to find out about students. And this was in 2008. And so I approached them and talked to them a long time. And we did the first small study, which I think was six or eight uh, different institutions. I, I think I saw Lisa Hinchliffe earlier. And she, there she is, and she, I don't know how many times you can listen to the PIL story, but there you are, you're, you're a good supporter. Le so, okay, thanks. I, I, you're right by the microphone, and I know you're gonna get up and say what's new. Okay, but Lisa was in that sample at University of Illinois in Urbana, and we started with the question of, really, an information literacy question of, how do students find information for course-related research, but we expanded that question also into their everyday life, uh, their everyday life worlds. What kinds of things, a lot of people said, oh, that's probably gonna be bar bets or where movies are playing, but we actually found that everyday life research was more risky for students and that, as one student said, you know, writing a course paper is about my skills, my ability, my knowledge. And everyday life research is about making purchasing decisions, making choices where it has, it lasts much longer than a semester. And so we found kind of an interesting contrast there that resulted actually, if that interests you, in a piece for First Monday on everyday life research. After, there was a lot of interest in that study and I'll come back to that in, in, in a couple of slides. But there was a lot of interest in that study. And so we went on and asked about, and this was MacArthur funded, this was a large study for us, it's probably our most cited work, where we looked at how do students evaluate and actually use information in their lives. We ended up, again, quantitatively testing a model that we had developed in the very first study, a preliminary model of the research process for students today, both in the course lives, as well their academic lives, as well as in their everyday lives. At that point, um, I, do, I, I should never read my press, um, but I do, and I obsess about it, I have to say, and somebody said, well, what about technology? I mean, you know, why wasn't PIL looking at technology? And we had an opportunity at that point to do the multitasking study, where it's probably my favorite study. Um, I've never heard someone say it's theirs, but I, I found it fascinating from a sampling point of view. We went into libraries, and I think there were about eight libraries in the sample during crunch time, two weeks before finals. And um, it's an interesting IRB challenge, but it got through. Um, and we interviewed students about what they were doing in the library. Um, at the time, there was a lot of concern and discussion that students just went to the library to look at Facebook. So we also looked at their laptops, which ended up being the technology that most of them had. Um, and said, what are you running on your laptop right now? So we were able to actually collect data at, from, from the actual occurrence that was going on in their lives at that point and talk to them about that. At that point, um, this is just the lay of the land. At that point, I was then a Berkman at Harvard and through that experience, I thought, talking to economists, to attorneys, to anthropologists, to young people from MIT lab, Media Lab, and I thought, what's really interesting is a much bigger question. And we've answered some of these smaller questions, but what's interesting is what kinds of, we ended up calling it, the, what kinds of critical information transitions do students, young people, go through in their lives? We've had older people in our sample, but for the most part, we tend to have probably 22 to 26 year olds in our sample. And what was that process like, that passage process from one information setting to the next? 
What constraints did they face? What workarounds? We ended up calling it strategic, adaptive strategies did they develop? And how did the process continue? We, the passage studies, I think, is some of our most important work because the first study focused on a sample that we had left out for a long time, first year college students. We knew they were different because they were coming into the college setting. They weren't like the seasoned junior or senior or even the sophomore. And what was that experience like? And then the second study that we did, I'm gonna talk about some of these findings. The second study that we did was funded by IMLS with a planning grant. And we ended up focusing on the workplace. And um, that study, we interviewed 20 employers as well as 20, uh, as well as doing focus groups with recent grads. And what was it like to solve information problems, something that resonated with employers in the workplace? And for employers, how did they make their hires? And um, kind of a spoiler alert, they tended to be dazzled by students that knew technology. And then gravely disappointed when students didn't pick up the phone to ask a question or ask the person next to them and checked on Google instead. And that was a fascinating finding in itself. And then to go and talk to the recent grads that had graduated within the last seven years, how was it out there? How, what, how was it similar to what they had gone through in college? How was it different? What was it like? I think one of my favorite quotes from that study was someone that said, a, a Harvard student actually, that was a congressional aide at the time over in Boston. And he said, the thing that really, after all this, that was most like my job today from college was when my choral group and I put on a performance and, in other words, a co-curricular activity, and we put on a performance in, in one of the spaces on campus, and all of a sudden, I'd seen a legal agreement for the first time. The other thing, someone said, well, you better license the music you're gonna play, and do you have parking for disabled? And so-and-so sick and can't make it, and the caterer doesn't do gluten-free. And he said, that's really what workplace information seeking is like for me. And that was very different than my experience here at Harvard. I was trained in certain areas, but it was that constant crisis, the fact that information moved so quickly and that the answer wasn't on Google, and that it really did take something that was collegial. That was a breakthrough for us, That's that particular study. The following study is our largest study it's the lifelong learning study funded generously by IMLS. They believed in this study um, and we looked at, we, we actually looked at the workplace again, but more the growth of conceptual knowledge and things that would really affect professional development instead of putting out fires at work. And then we also looked at personal life and found out there was a tremendous need for life skills in students' lives, especially interpersonal communication, but not in the way that you might think, in the way that students can't talk, more in the way that students have trouble um, with delegating to someone older than themselves, was something that came out. But there were also, they're not very sure, that, sure they can negotiate for a grade, but negotiating for a salary is different. The last category that we looked at in the lifelong learning study was something that really interested me, um, and that was based on something that actually Kate Kronteris at the Berkman was doing with Google on um, kind of political awareness of young people and how they follow different trends. So we talked some, and we ended up asking a question not about online community, but about community involvement. What happened after graduation? At that point, these are the last two, this is where we've been headed on this trajectory. We looked, as Joan referenced, and really thankful to have her for our SMART talk, 
um, is what we call the interview series, and it's up on the PIL site. We looked at library learning spaces because since PIL had started, libraries had changed dramatically, even in those last eight or nine years, and how they were providing services. And the growth and the evolution from information centers to learning commons to, to learning spaces. And how was that? And all of a sudden, libraries were brimming in those places. And how had the research process changed? How, what kinds of services were being provided? How did librarians and architects, two very different cultures, come together and work and create things like Hunt Library? Um, and how was that kind of changing the whole side of pedagogy and supportive pedagogy. And librarians' jobs, and deans' jobs, librarians' jobs in particular. Librarians were, became boundary spanners to be successful. And those that didn't tended to be isolated in their building. Lastly, um, here's where we are today. Something new for you, Lisa. Um, here's where we are today. We're looking at, I'm coming full circle. And um, with the learning spaces study and beginning to look at change, I'm asking how students have changed in what has been a 10-year journey for us. So we're, I think we're at nine years. Sometimes it feels like 100. But um, I think we're at nine years. And how have their processes changed? We know some of the tools have changed. Um, the availability, for instance, in focus groups that we're doing because we're doing focus groups at a number of different institutions. Um, the growing use of YouTube for really kind of bolstering what they're learning in class. Just the makeup of students that are replying to the invitation to participate in the focus groups is different. All of a sudden, I'm not seeing humanities students. We're seeing students in the sciences and the engineering. So we're making some inroads there into understanding what their needs are. And this is where we hear the great use of YouTube, for instance, the physics lecture. But there's more to it than that. The idea that you could go on YouTube and search, for instance, MIT, and find an MIT professor talking about microarrays or talking about an equation that you do in physics, and as one student said at UCLA, actually, at the beginning of last month, you have to understand when you hear a student do a video, they talk about where you get stuck. Professors don't. Professors present the equation. It looks really easy. And then I get home and I think, what? But the equation was so easy in class. This is different for the homework. How do I do this? So we're finding this use of these support tools. Certainly, some libraries are creating their own. But students, how they're evaluating what a good YouTube video is and how that's integrating into their process of research. And perhaps one of the saddest things I've heard from the field is a student, this is a wake-up call, that said, all I need to know What's gotten me through four years in college is Command F. Um, I don't use book. I don't use books. I don't like indices. It's Command F. Give me everything's online, and that's how I find different information. But that kind of precision, and these are students talking about their search strategies, something that we haven't heard about in the past. Um, they're swapping techniques that they use in these sessions. In other words, they're becoming more sophisticated, at least the students will follow it with a survey and be able to test this more empirically. But they're really becoming sophisticated in the areas that a number of us have MLSs in. I mean, they're thinking about search and they're thinking about search strategies. Across all of this, just to bring it back home, Really, what our study is about is about how today's students find and use information. That's my elevator pitch. That's my pitch on the plane when someone says, what do you do? And I say, I study college students. And they say, what? What do you study about them? Can I ask? 
hesitantly, and I say, I study how they find and use information. They usually pick up a magazine at that point. Or, or they ask me where their senior in, or junior in high school, what the best school is. <laughs> of course, we know it doesn't quite work like that. From each one of the studies that I just profiled here, you can find them on the PIL site. We made a decision early on that our materials would be open access and um, available, and we would not charge. We'd issue gray literature, but we'd also do uh, academic pieces in open access journals as well. So we publish a lot in First Monday. But within that range of studies, this has been our calling. This is the question. This is our true north. Each one of these studies has produced, I don't know, between 20 and 50 different findings. I will not go through all those findings with you. What I will do, though, is simplify it and talk about what the research takeaways are from what we've learned from this group of studies. The first one is, this is where we started with the finding study, and that is students, when we went out in the field in that very first study, said that something that we found really paradoxical, and that was that the research process is more difficult than ever before. Not more, this is what's great about a focus group, not more difficult for them and senior year versus sophomore year, uh, senior year in high school, but more difficult overall. That it just, finding information had drastically changed. When we asked, and I've done this before, when we asked um, for a series of adjectives, and we've asked this in a number of our follow-up studies, and they say, stay somewhat similar. This isn't particularly good news for those that teach or work with students. That they, but there's a story here that's worth explaining. And that is a number of students said that they really were afraid of, of conducting research. As one student said to us, what if I pick a topic that fails me? And again, in a focus group, I followed up with it and said, fail you in terms of a bad grade? It's like, no, fails me that there's not enough depth to it, or that, that I can't get the paper out of it, or that there's too much information. So it's this gauging process of information that is particularly challenging for students. What I have in the red type here is yet another kind of a layover of the findings. And that is, in the red, you see that two very different adjectives, and this came from our study of first year students, that students were both excited, sounds good, and overwhelmed. And when I thought about that, what we ended up doing was something called a ratio analysis. And um, with the ratio analysis, I backtracked where the interviews from those in the first year study had gone to high school. And then I compared, I used their Facebook pages actually to find out where they had gone to high school. And of course, you'd put that up there on your Facebook page if you were a first year college student, where you were from. And I backtracked and contacted each high school library and then did a comparison in this ratio analysis of the increase in size that students go through in these primary library resources that they encounter. And the first was that the library collection across our sample here was nine times larger in the college where they were enrolled. There's also community colleges in this sample as well as four-year colleges. So the library collection was very large to them and somewhat overwhelming. Where it gets interesting is there were 16 times more librarians, professional librarians. And this became really apparent when I made the rounds and called high school librarians, and you realized it was a one-person shop. If that high school was lucky enough to have a librarian, and often during the time I was talking to them on the phone, you'd hear them say things like, don't perk your bike over there, or um, I can help you in a minute, or do you need a ride home? Um, it really was a community and a community resource where we know from academic libraries that librarians, professional librarians, faculty, whatever title they have, have a number of different siloed functions 
that often over overlap in committee work, but they have unique job descriptions. And this was particularly problematic, how to read that environment for first-year college students. That, they weren't sure who to ask for help. I mean, I think that's the common response to that list of adjectives. Why aren't they asking librarians or somebody else for help? They didn't know who to ask. For instance, a student at Harvard said, I was looking, sounds good to start with, I was looking for a journal article that I found through PubMed. And I went, I couldn't find it online. And so I went to the shelf to look for the journal and that particular year was checked out or was somewhere in the library. And I looked around and I thought, who do I go to? It's a good comment, actually. Do I go to circulation? Because if I go to circulation, they may have the text or that particular issue, the bound periodical. Or do I go to reference? And where did they tell me reference was? And on Lamont Library, it's actually down a floor. It's not out. I think they've moved it out. They keep playing with that. But the last one also, I think, is these increase is the number of databases. And this is without Harvard in the sample. Harvard actually, I think, had 1,003 databases. It took them um, a month to answer the question when I asked them how many. They'd never counted how many databases that they had and talked to a number of people there. But without Harvard in the sample, the students on average at these institutions that they ended up going to college in were faced with 19 times more databases. But as one first year student pointed out to me, what's important to realize is even though your high school might have had something that was ProQuest, as she said, I had ProQuest at my high school, but this interface looks totally different. I had the training wheels model of ProQuest in, I love it. I had the training wheel model of ProQuest while, while I was in high school. And I thought, oh, ProQuest, I can do this paper in no time. And I looked at it, and it looked nothing like I had spent so much time learning in high school. So this transferability of skills is, a, is particularly problematic. We're dropping, down call, we're dropping down students, or they're being dropped down, into environments that are very different for them. And to their credit, some libraries actually, academic libraries, have started working with high schools to orient students before they go to that particular institution where they've been accepted. Harvard, actually, and Sue Gilroy, who used to be on our study, it's on Practical PIL, um, had developed a video, uh, actually, it's really great. Uh, yeah, I think it's a video that she, it's up on YouTube, but it's on our practical PIL page that um, is sent to students over the summer before they enter Harvard about what research is like at Harvard. And it pulls and integrates a lot of PIL's findings without saying that, and talks to them about the difficulties they might encounter based on what we had found. Really what we can conclude from this research takeaway is this shift, this profound shift from scarcity of information where you used to be able to do a research project and say no stone unturned, I can guarantee it, to an abundance of information that is impossible to keep up with. And you find this subtle shift of moving from knowing facts to gathering consensus and finding three sources that pretty much say the same thing, and you'll call it good. This is a significant departure for the research process. The next takeaway that I want to talk about builds on this. What, it, what is more, most difficult for students during the research process? And what we found was using a scale and using results from our 2010 study. I'd like to test this again, but I think from the focus groups, it's pretty much held, and from what we've found, is getting started on assignments. And here's some data, it's just a, a version of the data that we found where students run into trouble. 
This was kind of a game changer for some librarians because they had put their emphasis on teaching students search and using the different resources. Yes, it's problematic, but it's that first step of the research process, which is really defining and narrowing down a research topic. And um, what you find here is that as what we concluded here is that students often said conducting research for courses is like gambling. It's an interesting metaphor. You don't know if you're gonna choose a topic that's gonna work. You don't know if that topic is gonna satisfy what your professor wants. And you really don't know if you'll be able to capture it well and collect enough information to have a college level paper. And you can see where there is, whether it's gambling or not, there is a lot of risk associated for, as one student said, the most difficult part of research is getting to the question to ask. And again, hedging your bets, trying to figure out a topic. Even if you're, we found a really interesting trend at UCLA, again, where professors really promoted discovery. And in the focus group, students, some in social sciences would say, I know, we could write on anything we wanted. And it was supposed to be on housing inequality. And it's like, no, that's good. You know, <laughs> that's exploration. That's what you're hoping. You don't want something narrowly defined. You have all these resources to help you discover what interests you, especially at this time in your life. And that may help shape where you go or what your interests are or where you end up working. But that point was, was missed. It wasn't seen as an invitation to discovery. Now, not all professors do that, but I think today in the field, we're finding an interesting trend of how professors have changed, some professors have changed their assignments, and how students are responding to that. This is a model that we developed in really looking at, if research is difficult, more difficult than ever before. If difficulties start with beginning research, what are these frustrations about? Is there a thread running through the different conversations, interviews, as well as the quantitative data that we've collected that can tell us in a way what the student research process is? And what we came up with was a model, and this is definitely an adjustable model. This model changes probably for every student and every research topic that they conduct, and what class or discipline that they're in, and what the different constraints are. But we found there are four different research contexts that take up time for students at the beginning, that are laborious. If you work with students, if you work in reference, or if you have in your past, or if you're in instruction, this probably resonates with you. The first is needed most often, and that is big picture context. And what that is, is getting a summary of what something is about and getting your arms around it. Um, a student in one of our focus groups at a CSU actually said, I was writing a paper on the, US's, the U United States policy um, in the South China Seas in a public policy class. And he said, uh, you know, I needed to go and find out what it had been in the past, and what it was now, and had it changed in the last week, and his go-to tool, any guesses? Wikipedia. You know, and then always saying, you can never cite Wikipedia. We've written, actually, a paper about the use of Wikipedia um, that we did, it was published in First Monday and the reason student use, students use Wikipedia. And it is often to obtain this big picture context, but it's a little bit more. Not only do they get language context and the meaning of different words, they also get something succinct. They get citations, actually, through footnotes. We heard that. But they also get something succinct. As one student said, you have to understand Wikipedia is my Here's a word for you, pre-search process. 
and <laughs> what it helps me. It's not real research. It's just figuring out what research is going to be. And at another institution, small liberal arts college, a student said, it's the .05 step. They know they're not doing real research at that point, but they're really trying to decide on those problematic areas of coming up with a topic. And that tool works particularly well. As well as you also hear newspaper articles. New York Times does often good summaries. Students know to use these resources. So not all students are going to Wikipedia, but Wikipedia gives certain assurances. And what we've heard now in the focus groups that we've been doing since January is one student said, I love what I do when I'm in the field because it's a perfect age. And you're so self-assured and you know so little. Um, <laughs> it never, you, I never can show my hand. I'm, and at one point a student said, you know, Wikipedia's really improved with time. <laughs> You know, I'm looking, I said, I, I, I'm kind of looking at your um, demographic. How old are you? I'm 21. I've seen tremendous gains <laughs> in Wikipedia. And it's just it's like a great time in your life. I, I, I don't know if you're ever that ridiculously confident. And, and, and college kind of encourages the use of taking that kind of stand. So what, what I get to do is very fun. Um, so there is, what we're hearing in the focus groups now is that Wikipedia has improved somehow. And still, however, that professors don't think it's a good resource. And, but still students are drawn to it. And probably my favorite reason for using Wikipedia, it gives me the confidence that if somebody can write an entry, somebody, a crowdsourced entry, if you can have an entry that's just a page long when you print it out, it means I could get a paper out of it. There, it wouldn't be too long. So they're actually even sizing up the length of the Wikipedia entry. So that's probably the big picture context, which makes perfect sense to have a summary. Tell me what I'm talking about. What are the choices? We all do it. We all use Wikipedia. But it's interesting to see this weave into the course research process as something that's kind of happening beyond the classroom, that's something that's not discussed. The second is information gathering here. And with information gathering, we see that this comes up often. And with information gathering, um, what happens is, again, almost like my first set of slides with the ratio analysis in the takeaways, this is a very different environment for college students. And um, the story that we heard here was uh, a, st a story I heard from a Harvard student was a junior. She said, um, she was so articulate when she responded, I wrote her and said, no, this isn't for professors, this is for students. She said, no, actually, I am a student. She had this beautiful English accent. She showed up. And her parents were both physicians, and she grew up in New York and went to a prep school. And I thought, this is she's a total outlier here. This should be interesting. And she told the following story. She said she had a, a policy class, and they were doing a paper. They were working in a team. And she said, and the professor had said, you need to see Elsie, blah, 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 blah. And she, I've told this story before because it, it captures the information gathering problem. And she said, Elsie, in the library. So she trotted over to Lamont, the undergrad library. She looked around, it comes back, there's a thread here. And she thought, there's no Elsie. I, you know, they're not wearing name tags. Huh, I wonder who Elsie is. I can't figure it out. And so, I mean, she really stressed about it. And then with her group, she said, has anybody met Elsie? <laughs> and they said, oh, no, what are you looking for? And she goes, well, they said this resource, and Elsie has it. And she said, no, that's the call number. Where, well, her high school had used Dewey. And as she said, I mean, so as she said, she's just really 
unruffled and said, oh, oh, I, oh, now I understand. that I always went and saw Dewey, not Elsie. Okay, I got it. And that, that was her breakthrough moment. And at that point, they brought a librarian in. The group did, to their benefit, and um, brought a librarian in to work with them on the research. The students themselves realized that that mapping didn't transfer from one environment to the next. The next context is language. And again, language, if you really think about taking general ed, it still takes years off me. I also went to Berkeley as an undergrad, where in the morning you'd have anthropology and you'd have a list. Okay, ethnography is, and you know, you'd go through that, and then you, after your anthro class, you'd have another course. And um, the terms of the discipline were so different that it was almost like you were taking four or five different language courses in foreign languages. And this is a particular stumbling block for students. What we found most recently in our studies um, is students don't get this. And how this translates horribly is coming up with keywords. Because if you don't understand language, it's impossible to come up with the keywords. This isn't the old days with the red, vine, or the red leather two volumes of subject headings where the librarian, when I was an undergrad at Moffa, would walk you over and show you the subject headings. And you would choose a subject heading, and they'd say, you can find anything in the card catalog. Here, Doe, Moffat, all of it. And you thought, oh, I got this piece of paper. This is what I need to be able to find my way around this campus. And the web has undone that for us. And to illustrate that point, one student said to us in a focus group last month, now wait, I always forget, is it keywords or buzzwords? <laughs> Which is actually pretty well stated. The last one, and then you hear people in the focus group saying, let me explain it to you. Which is interesting in itself. The last one is situational context. And situational context is the surrounding circumstances. Usually, with course-related research, that's grades. And that's also when it's due, and citation styles, and don't plagiarize. And in fact, that's what assignment handouts tend to promote to students, because we've studied those as well. But situational in everyday life is something that does come up, and it really is that risk averse for everyday life research. One student from the Midwest was talking about canning ham, and said, I went on the web, and without saying this, I looked for consensus about how to can a ham. And, she, and he said, ah, some of the information wasn't right. I mean, it didn't add up. It wasn't the same solution. And he said, I went down to the county extension office and figured that's where I'd get an answer. Because if I chose the wrong answer, pause, I could die. And um, so the consequences of situation are interesting, and they certainly extend beyond course-related research. Kind of move along here. What we get are students that really do use a strategy that's really based on predictability, familiarity, non-exploration, and more and more what we're finding in the focus groups that we're doing now, efficiency, command F, any shortcut they can come up with. So here's Michael, and Michael is not every student, but he's a lot of students. Michael is risk averse. In other words, he plays it safe. He often, whether you call it the game, as some students call it, I know that it's a game and that instructor knows what they want and that's what I'm after, or you call that the answer. That really does translate from high school. The idea of what inquiry is is really unknown to a lot of different students. Also, um, something that we found in the first year study, which I found really concerning, is really not understanding how libraries work in reference. And if you stand in that line for reference, as one first year student told me, oh no, I said, how come you don't go over to reference? And she said, oh, I can't do that. Those are for special students. They get a special scholarship coming in. They're the ones that need the help. So those resources are for them. This whole idea of student preparedness and the fact that you're cut loose in college 
and you're throwing in with a bunch of students that have had tremendously different opportunities or disadvantages than you have. It is not an even playing field at all. But this concern that you must appear self-sufficient. And often students procrastinate. What we've, which, but we've also looked into that. It's, what you, it's nice to do repeat studies. Um, or to do an online study like this, I mean, an ongoing study. But what we've found is procrastination's actually changed a little bit based on what students tell us. It's often because they're balancing work from their classes, they're taking more classes to get through four years as costs go up, and often, whether your family has money or not, you're working a couple of jobs to make ends meet. This is not a reason for procrastination that research found in the social science 20 or 30 years ago, that it really was a lack of confidence. It's a different experience, in other words. What we find is that, and I've mentioned some of these resources, students really do tread a well-worn path here. They rely on course readings, which some people say, course readings? But yes, course readings is the map for situational context of what the professor expects. Students have told us this year in the focus groups, that's where you get the concepts that matter. That's where you mention the concept in your paper if you want a better grade. Now, if you're a professor and you really, for lack of a better word, want to jack a student around, what you do is you go into a class and say, who did the reading? And then, I did this inadvertently one time. I didn't think it was that good. What'd you think? And, but you chose it. And you can say, but sometimes in scholarly communication, there's not the perfect reading even for me. And that's what knowledge is. It's evolving. It turned out to be a good lesson. Also, we see the use of Google and Wikipedia. Google Scholar's an interesting transition. This is maybe one of the biggest transitions students make in college, is to jump from Google to Google Scholar as a way to use a familiar, as one student said, a tab away resource, that a tab away from Google search that is familiar with, to them, that gets them the journal articles that their professors say that they need. JSTOR's up here, somebody should groan like JSTOR, but this is really what students we've heard say they go to most often. And they often go because a professor recommends it. Government sites, of course, a whole area, and for this conference, an area of continued discussion. Um, government sites in particular are used in the social sciences for data, and um, how that will change in the Trump administration should be interesting to research assignments. And then instructors to close the loop. And with instructors closing the loop, what you do is it's the situational context. You go back to the instructor and say, am I on the right track before you turn in the paper? Some students say, I know they have the answer somewhere in that office, and they might hand me a book, or they might hand me a special article, and that's gold. So it's an interesting hedging of bets Okay, my time is dwindling, so I'm gonna move ahead through um, a couple of slides here. Go-to experts. This is an interesting comparison based on what we hear from students. Students go to instructors. Professors are their research coaches. Not only are the, the, they the ones with the sanction of the grade, they are the ones seen as having knowledge. One student told me about librarians, she said, God, I went to a library and they were really helpful. <laughs> and you never can show your hand. I said, really? And she's a first year student. She said, God, they knew so much. I mean, it really helped on my paper. And I said, what was that like? And she said, well, you know, the best thing is she doesn't tell your professor you were here. This is kind of like a research therapist. You come in here, you can tell her your problems and they really help. And then she paused, and, this is your field and mine, and then she paused and said, this is another great thing about this age, she said, you know, they're kind of 
altruistic. <laughs> and I said, I bet you did really well on the SAT in verbals. She goes, nailed it. <laughs> in a study that we did looking at handouts, and the thing that is so problematic in seeing professors as your research coach, we found that most professors in 191 handouts that we analyzed from 29 different schools, we found that most of them recommended for resources to use a place-based resource, a book in the library with one copy. Now you can imagine, say it's a lecture this big, somebody says they have to use a restroom, they are racing to the library to get that book. If you're gonna buy the book, it's not gonna happen. This is problematic in that relationship, that thread between professors and librarians. There have been some gains in this area where librarians at different institutions have worked with professors on really perfecting a good handout for an assignment. Probably one of the most important things is include what inquiry is, what you're asking students to do. Only 16% of the handouts we looked at did that. The best one said, pretend like you're Sherlock Holmes, and you're gonna find different facts and clues, and you may have to go back and revisit them. And this was a metaphor that was particularly representative of what the research process was like. So, all that being said, and I'm hurrying along here, I always think I don't have enough slides and I always have too many. What happens over time is that students' research processes do evolve and change. This isn't all bad news. They do experience improvements. Some of these I've touched on. The first year, the aha moments we found based on our research over nine studies and now the focus groups have been this transition from Google to Google Scholar. I know that's not the best solution, but it shows some recognition of you need scholarly research and how to be able to assess that. At the same time, an aha moment for students, a breakthrough was abstracts. Or as one student said to me, it's quite a lovely thing, those abstracts. <laughs> and then hesitantly said, they give a summary. And you knew the bubble above her head was like, but not Wikipedia. Um, that summaries aren't always bad, that they are a way to be able to make important choices about the sources that you use and how far you look at different resources. Once you have a major, we found the citation trail, which is really a librarian term, has come up quite a bit. And also evaluation criteria gets better as well as ethical issues of what plagiarism is, or at least a recognition you need to cite information. Somebody came up with that idea that you didn't come up with. After college, this is important. Um, we did a lifelong learning study of recent grads that was funded by IMLS and asked them in what their takeaway skills were. What had they learned or developed during college, in classes or not, or beyond, the choral group? And what did they apply or adapt in their lives now, their post-college lives? And we found that those information processing skills were strong from their point of view. They may have not been perfect, but they felt that they had enough to work with and walked away as satisfied customers. But what they didn't feel that they walked away with was the ability to ask and frame questions of their own. Sure, they could ask a question about whether it was on the test or what a concept meant, but they really didn't develop the process of asking questions about how it tied into areas that interested them. As one student at a big public said, you need to understand when we did follow-up interviews. This is an institution that has a model of how to get me out in four years. It's a model of efficiency. I'm in a lecture hall with 600 different students, and that's been my experience here. I'm not raising my hand and slowing that model down. And it's, it's, a, it's a pretty damning statement about how some students view that process and how they realize they need, once they get a job, to be able to ask questions. 
What employers want, and this is from the workplace study, what employers want is a skill that students have, this ability to integrate information, the gray, gray lettering at the top. But in the red is what students didn't have, the recent grads they had hired. Probably most importantly, they didn't see research as a social process, as something that was contextual. Who does best here? Often nurses. As one nurse said in focus groups we did on the workplace study, you got to understand if somebody keeps, if a group of people keeps coming in with a certain flu strain, I'm not going to find the answer on Google. I'm going to have to go to the supervising nurse and say, have, is there a pattern here? I'm going to have to look at the evidence and the context that's important, that's that's going around in my environment. And this is where students lacked. And overall, maybe something that is pretty damning about how we teach research and how we educate our students, and I'm glad to see is changing to a certain degree, is this emphasis on print-based resources. Everything you can find is print, and it's online. And employers totally dispute that and feel that the, student, that the grads they end up with may be able to find things online, but it's really the context of the workplace. Lastly, there are promising changes coming around some of these key findings. Some of these are happening in community colleges. Some of these are happening in large uh, public institutions. We see a movement towards fewer lessons on search. There's an interesting piece in Library with the Lead Pipe, um, that has uh, a piece that Marianne Dietering wrote with Hannah Ramsell about integrating curiosity into teaching search. Instead of asking to find something, let students define what their interests are. Some of these fixes are relatively easy. It's a way of rethinking how we're teaching. And then secondly, um, this effort to tie it all together is being taught more and more, and this movement towards peer support. Whether that's peer-to-peer -peer reference, or UCLA has worked in the area of having embedded students that are experts that they've worked with in classes that can help students on different research projects as an employee of the library. In other words, students are going to ask their peers. It is like the YouTube example that I began with of, I like when it's an MIT student that has, talks about where students get stuck. And then lastly, what is working? Often people say, I find you depressing. I'm not. There are things, that, it's usually public librarians, um, there are things that are working. And it's certainly evaluation. Students really, Go out and do a focus group in the post-truth era. Bias comes up about every 10 minutes. Some of these things are really sticking, but I think the reason that they are is evaluation often starts in kindergarten. It starts at home. It grows. The demands for evaluation change as your education does. You see it in, your, in the classroom, but you also see it in the work that librarians do with students. I'll end on that note. Thank you.